Well, every once in a while, there's a movie that is made and it captivates the world. Every once in a while, uh, there's a movie that comes out that people race to go and see. And people always continually talk about it. And, and, and it dominates the headlines. It's on every single billboard. Action figures get made and merchandise gets printed. And for all purposes, these types of movies, they don't just hold our attention, but they actually revolutionize the cinema industry. And without a doubt, that movie for me, the first, type, the first movie that I think of in that category is The Matrix. Now, I don't know if some of you remember when the first Matrix came out in 1999. Some of you may not have been born, but, um, but that, that was an, it was an amazing film. And it was meant to give us a different perspective on reality. It was meant to ask the question, is the world that we live in the true one? It was meant for you and me to start to look at everything that we're experiencing, everything that we're eating, dancing, working, running, laughing, stepping on the pavement, holding a spoon. Is any of it real? Or is it just something that's been layered on top of what is true? It's kind of meant to be one of those kind of mind-bending movies, if you remember. And the whole movie uh, is pretty much one chase scene after another where you have these agents and, and they're running after this guy named Neo and, and his new friends, all because Neo is suspected of maybe being this chosen one, the one who's going to come and show everyone uh, the truth, who's going to set people free and help them to understand what reality truly is. And of course, Agent Smith and, and all the other agents, they don't want to see that happen. And so they're chasing Neo and his friends through scene after scene after scene in the movie. And then do you remember what happens at the end of the movie? At the end of the movie, Neo is being chased down again by these agents and he, he faces a brutal attack and, and it leaves him dead, right? But miraculously, after the kiss of his one true love, a woman named Trinity, Neo comes back to life. And do you remember what Trinity says to Neo after she kisses him and he, and he breathes again? She says, get up, Neo. <laughs> and as a strong woman should, she encourages her man to get back up and fight. And that's what he does. And suddenly he realizes with confidence that he is the chosen one. And he, he stands up and he, he turns to face the agents. And, and they're in shock and they don't know what to do. And so they just fire a dozen bullets at him. And in this crazy moment, what happens? But time slows down for Neo. And he simply extends his hand towards this array of incoming bullets. And he says one word. Do you remember the one word? No. He just says no. And they all freeze in midair. And he plucks one of them out of the air. And then he waves his hand. And they all just fall down to the ground. And Agent Smith, he, he is amazed at this. He doesn't know what is going on. And so he just rushes at Neo to fight him. But instead of being intimidated by Agent Smith, what does Neo do? But he just fights back as if it's in slow motion. And at one point, he even puts one hand behind his back and he just fights him with one arm. And then with a, a Bruce Lee-style kick, he just drives Agent Smith down the hallway and he disappears forever. In that moment, in this movie... Neo shows that he is operating on a different level than whatever comes against him. In that final scene, Neo is shown to be greater and stronger than everything in the real world and greater and stronger than anything in the more mystical matrix. Now, you know, I think if we're all being honest, we really wish that each of us could be greater and stronger than everything that comes against us in our lives. And all of us have experienced trials and temptations and harsh circumstances and addictions and, and heavy burdens. And perhaps some of us even in the room today would say that we've, exp we've experienced extreme spiritual attack at different times in our lives. All of us wish that we could just fend off all of these things just like Neo from the Matrix. But I think if we're being truthful, most of us would pro have probably come to realize by now that we are not strong enough are great enough to fight these battles on our own. And yet, brothers and sisters, I'm here to encourage you today that there is one who fights on our behalf. And there is one in whom we have the hope of deliverance, of victorious deliverance. There is one who is greater. There is one who is stronger. And his name is Jesus. And so today, that's the message that I bring to you through God's word. That Jesus is God, the true Messiah, who is greater than everything. 
Now, if you have your Bibles with you today, you can go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. It'll also be up here for you on the screen. And let me show you today just how amazing our Lord and Savior truly is. Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. The story that I'm about to read for you is the true story of Jesus and his disciples. Hear the word of the Lord. Now on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him, uh, they took him with them into the boat, just as he was. And the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had, been off, he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you, by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there in the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, uh, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it into the city and into the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus, and they saw the demon-possessed man the one who had the legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged that he might be with him, and, and he did not permit him, but said, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away, and he began to proclaim in the Decapolis, just how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, our passage is one amazing story, right? Told in two parts. One amazing story told in two parts. And it all begins in verse 35, where we see that Jesus says, Let us go across to the other side. And then it all ends in chapter 5 in verse 21, where they do in fact make it back from their journey. And we read in verse 21, And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Now, the Gospel of Mark is a book that is very interested in introducing its readers, you and me, to Jesus and to his kingdom. In the first three and a half chapters of the book, Jesus has been fulfilling prophecies, he's been teaching, he's been healing, and he's been calling his disciples to follow him. And all of this he's been doing at a rapid and exciting pace. And as the momentum has been building in the story, so too has the question, this question right here, who is Jesus? And to answer that question, Jesus chose to speak in parables. And he maintained the mystery for all of those except those who he had called and had chosen to come after him. Now, despite all that had happened so far in those first three and a half chapters, all that Jesus had done, the disciples still did not know how to answer this question about their rabbi's identity. They still said simply, they still didn't know who Jesus was, right? 
And yet, this sea journey that we just read about, from one side of the Sea of Galilee to the other, and then back, it is a moment where the volume gets turned up on this question. And so again, as we look at this passage today, and as we break it open, I believe it clearly and powerfully shows us that Jesus is God, the true Messiah, who is greater than everything. But what do we mean when we say that he's greater than everything? What do we mean when we're talking about everything? Well, the first part of this story begins to answer that question by demonstrating that Jesus is God over the natural. Jesus is God over the natural. And there's a wonderful way that this text does that. It takes us to two parts of the Old Testament and brings us back so that we might be able to see the truth of who Jesus is. And the first part of the Old Testament that it brings us back to is the story of Jonah. How many of you guys remember the story of Jonah? right? Jonah, he was a prophet. He was called by God, told by God to go to preach to his enemies, to go tell them to repent and to seek forgiveness. But did Jonah want to do that? No, Jonah didn't want to do that, right? Because Jonah wanted them to get what was theirs. He wanted them to get what was coming for them. Jonah knew that the promise of God was that if I preach repentance to them and they actually do repent, they actually will be forgiven. They actually will be restored. And and Jonah wanted a much different ending for those people in Nineveh. And so, in the story, what does Jonah do? But he runs away, right? God says, go to Nineveh, go in this direction. And Jonah says, nope. And he goes in the complete opposite direction. In fact, he tries to flee the call and the presence of God so much that he gets a ticket on a boat to go to the farthest place in the known world at that time. He tries to get to Tarshish, right? And And he tries to run away, not just from his calling, but run away from God. And so he gets in a boat. Remember the story? He gets in a boat and God sends a storm. And and there's this crazy storm that's happening and it's hitting the boat. And do you remember what Jonah was doing during the crazy storm? He was sleeping. He was sleeping in the middle of the storm. And the other sailors, they wake him up and they yell at him and they say, Come on, Jonah, call out your God, help us. It takes a while, but Jonah finally admits, hey guys, the reason for this storm is me. God has sent this storm. If you just throw me overboard, the storm will calm and everything will be quieted down. But of course, the sailors, they don't want to be murderers, and so they don't want to do that. And so do that. And so it takes some convincing. They say, no, Jonah, we don't want to do that. We're not going to do it. But finally, they, they admit it's their only hope, and so they throw them overboard. And what happens? But God stops the storm. Now, if you haven't read the rest of the story, it's a pretty amazing story. you got to go and read it, right? Jonah gets swallowed by a great big fish, and after three days in his own repentance, he is spat up back onto the shore, and he then goes and he does preach repentance. And then, of course, they do repent, and they do get forgiven, and they are restored, and then Jonah's happy about it, right? He's not. If you remember the story, he's bitter under a tree that that was the outcome that he knew would be for the people that he hated. And it's a great story for you and for me that teaches us that we ought to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. It's a great story where the gospel is woven throughout. We see God's mercy on display. But why do I tell you this story about Jonah? Well, it's for this reason. If you look at the story of Jonah that I just told you, And if you look at the story from Mark that we just read, it is impossible for you and for me not to see the parallels between the two stories, right? Let's look at those parallels together, the parallels between the two. Mark chapter 4, verse 37. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. Jonah chapter 1, verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Mark chapter 4, verse 38. But he, Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Jonah chapter 1, verse 5. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down, and he was fast asleep. And so Jesus and Jonah are both on a boat, and they're both in the middle of a violent windstorm, and they're both asleep. And both the sailors and the disciples are coming to them saying, Don't you care? Right? Let's continue to look at the parallels. Jonah chapter 1, verse 15. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Mark chapter 4, verse 39. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind 
ceased, and there was a great calm. Jonah chapter 1, verse 16, and the men feared the Lord exceedingly. Mark chapter 4, verse 41, and they were filled with great fear. Now the fear that's actually happening to the sailors is a little different. It's a reverent awe. It's, it's an amazement. It's a, I cannot believe what just happened. It is a fear that went moved to worship. And if you remember the end of Jonah, that story in Jonah, they actually, they actually make sacrifices and vows to Jonah's God. They actually, it becomes worship. But in the case of the disciples, their fear has not yet moved to worship. They're scared to death. They're still terrified. You see, the parallels are fascinating, right? You might look at this and go, that's kind of amazing how in both stories it's so similar. But why again do I tell you this? I tell you this because all that happened on the Sea of Galilee that evening happened exactly the way that it did so that all the disciples and so that you and me would stop and remember that the last time in the story of God when there was a raging sea and a giant windstorm that could be calmed in an instant, it didn't happen because a man calmed it. It happened because God up the storm. And so when Jesus is able to do it, what does that say about Jesus? But it says that he must be God, right? You see, the answer to the question here that the disciples have, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him, is right here. He's God. Jesus is God. Now, while this Jonah connection is an outstanding one, there's also a second Old Testament connection in here. And that second one takes you and me from understanding that Jesus isn't just the God-man. He's not just God, but he's also the promised Messiah. He's also the anointed one. He's also the true prophet, priest, and king of Israel. He's also the Savior, the Redeemer, Emmanuel, God with us. And that Old Testament connection that we see is from Psalm 107, where David writes this messianic prophecy a thousand years before Jesus is born. This is what we see in Psalm 107. Pick me up in verse 23. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he had commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. David writes exactly what's going to happen that night on the Sea of Galilee and how the people doing business are going to feel their emotions in that moment. He writes it all, like I said, a thousand years before this moment occurs. And David describes even the rescue in the storm. And he does it with the, using the same language of Jonah chapter 1 in Mark chapter 4. And this connection between Mark chapter 4 and Psalm 107, again, shows you and me that Jesus isn't just God, but that he is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one truly who fulfills all of the prophecies of old. You see, the storm on the Sea of Galilee is the epitome of what the natural world could throw at a person. And Jesus shows clearly that in his sovereign power, he is greater and stronger than anything in the natural. And he does it by simply speaking a word and making the storm cease. Jesus in Mark chapter 4, verse 39, rebukes the wind and the waves. And the power of nature is on display to demonstrate that he is in fact the God who reigns superior over the natural world. But the story I read for you doesn't stop there, does it, right? The story continues as they continue on their journey, and we see that he is also God over the supernatural world, right? The second part of our story shows us that Jesus is God over the supernatural. Now, remember, this story was not just about taking a nice boat ride in the evening. It was about reaching the other side. There was a destination in mind. Look at chapter uh, 5, verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. 
Now, as soon as Jesus arrives, immediately, right, immediately, right away, he is met by this man who has something supernatural that is going on. Now, I, I, did, I went to seminary, I learned some of the Greek, I don't remember it all, but I remember some of it, and I was able to look at some of the Greek here and what it says, and it's really helpful for you and for me as we try to understand what's going on here, and, and what the Greek shows us here is that this is a showdown in a sense. It literally reads in the Greek, out of the boat came Jesus, out of the tombs came the man, out of the boat came Jesus, out of the tombs came the man. And so this is where our Western movies get their cues from, right? You can hear the crack of the whip right now. You could, you could see them squinting at each other, the sun you know, coming down. You can see the tumbleweed going across as there's about to be a standoff that's going to take place between Jesus and the man. But what's going on here with this man that is coming at Jesus? The text says that he has an unclean spirit. And again, that means that he is uh, foul, unholy. It's a word that means that there's something off about this man deep within him, in his spirit, at the core of who he is. Maybe you've heard the expression, something just doesn't smell right. right? Maybe you've heard that before. This is the same thing that's going on here. There's something off about this man. But in every single biblical reference to this type of thing, it's not just that this person is weird or quirky, but it's that there's something dark and evil deep inside. Say it another way, this man coming out of the tombs is possessed by something dark, demonic, and it's made him diabolical. The description of the man supports this inter interpretation if we look at verse 3. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles into pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. The text says the man lived in the tombs. He was banished and he was put outside the camp by the authorities. But his choice of home out of anywhere that he could have lived was a place where the dead were kept. That should tell you about his state. Everything about this man reeked of darkness and death. And furthermore, he was in the land of the Gerasenes, which is, is the land of the Gentiles. And, and that, that meant that, uh, that that was a place that most people who were Jewish would try to stay away from because of all the implications of, of uncleanliness and uncleanly behavior. But he wasn't just in the land of the Gentiles, but this specific place, the land of the Gerasenes, was a place where they raised pigs. And pigs to the Jews were, were a representation of filth. They were a forbidden animal. You couldn't be in the presence of a pig. You couldn't touch a pig. You couldn't eat a pig. But praise the Lord for the New Covenant uh, Church. You and I can now have bacon. Amen. Uh, back in the day you couldn't, but now you can. So uh, praise the Lord for Jesus and for bacon uh, in that order. Um, this man, he represented darkness and uncleanliness to the highest degree from his spirit to his residence. Now, also notice that this man wasn't just banished away from his community, but he was imprisoned, right? He was a man who was tormented. He was at war with himself. He was trying to hurt himself. He was an outcast. He was impure. He was imprisoned. The devil was clearly trying to destroy him. And church, do you know that that's the truth for you and for me? This is what the devil does. Remember the words of John 10, 10 from Jesus, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And remember what the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Church, here's the devil's plan. He knows that you and me and all of humanity are made in the image of God and we are called to be image bearers, to reflect the goodness of who God is. And, and he, he knows that we're meant to shine a light and, he, and he's hoping that if he can just get us and if he can warp us and, if he can, and he, if he can break us, that what he can do is he can rob God of his glory somehow. Now it's an impossible plan, but it's his plan. It could never work, but it's what he's trying to do. This man is a clear attempt from the devil to try to destroy an image bearer. This man is not only a representation of darkness and death in his spirit and in his residence, but again, it actually becomes a manifestation of the appearance of the demonic. 
when Jesus approaches, which, by the way, when Jesus approaches, what do you think the disciples were doing? What do you think you and I would be doing? They're probably racing back to the boat, trying to get back into the water. They're probably shouting out to Jesus, Jesus, look out, he's coming, let's get back in, let's go out. You and I would be doing the same thing. We'd be terrified and trying to run, but not Jesus. Because Jesus enters into the darkness. Jesus goes into the places that are unclean. And Jesus brings about the light and brings about the wholeness and restoration that he's always promised. Our Jesus is not afraid. And so as Jesus approaches, the man falls down before him, not in worship, but out of respect for Jesus' authority. And as he does, the demons start controlling his words, right? It's a combination of the man and the demons that come out and respond to Jesus. Remember, Jesus says, what's your name in the singular? And and, and the man starts to answer, my name is Legion. But then very quickly he shifts to, and we are many. It's a combination. Now, I, I didn't really know what a legion was. Maybe you do, but I had to do some research. And I found out that a legion is 5,600 men. It's 5,600 men. Now, that's a lot of demons. And, and I don't know if there were 5,600 demons within the man, but we do know there were 2,000 pigs that ran off the side. So that means at least 2,000 demons were probably in this man. That is a lot of demons. That's a lot of oppression. And the text says that after Jesus commands the demons out of the man, the townsfolk, they come to Jesus, right? And we'll get what verse 15 says. They saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind. You see, just like in the first part of the story, what we see right here is that Jesus has power over the supernatural world. And this story presents us with a claim as well that Jesus is in fact God. Just like in the first part of the story where we saw that Jesus had power over the, world, over the, the natural world and he was God and he, and he was also the Messiah, right? We see the same thing here. He has power over the supernatural world. We also see that he is God. God the Messiah. Let's see how we identify that in this passage. To this point in the Gospel of Mark, no human being has been able to identify Jesus for really, who, truly who he is. And yet suddenly as he finds himself before this man with all the demons, the demons are, are the ones who, in the presence of the incarnate God-man, they are the ones who call out and identify Jesus properly before his disciples. Look at verse 7. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. You see, the disciples, they've been watching. They've probably been trembling. They're on the edge of the boat, and they would have now witnessed twice within a matter of hours this rabbi who they were following not just proved to be a good teacher, not just proved to be a prophet or a wise philosopher, not just proved to be a cool guy who knew magic tricks. Suddenly, Jesus of Nazareth was openly being put on display for who he was and is. He was being put on display as the one who is greater and stronger than everything in the natural world and in the supernatural world. Say it another way. Jesus is God, the true Messiah, who is greater than everything. Now, just as I said about the storm on the Sea of Galilee, this possessed man is the epitome of what spiritual attack looks like on a person. And Jesus clearly shows his sovereign power demonstrating that he's greater and stronger than the supernatural by simply speaking and setting this man free. Now, of course, a couple years later, Jesus shows his power over the natural and the supernatural. He shows his power over sin and death. Amen? By by dying on that cross and, and by being raised to new life, he is the one who can conquer both of those things, sin and death, so that we might be free. Amen? And so Jesus, in his great power, is also continually shown as the story unpacks. Now, as we look at these two parts of this exciting story in the Gospel of Mark, Right in the middle of the story, right in the middle of these two stories, this one larger story, we see like a linchpin holding everything together. There's a question that Jesus asks. Look at Mark chapter 4, verse 40. He said to them, Why are you still, or why are you so afraid? 
Have you still no faith? Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Now, if we look at the Gospel of Luke, the same story is told there, and Luke provides a little bit more nuance to what Jesus is asking. Luke chapter 8, verse 25 says this, He said to them, Where is your faith? Where is your faith? You see, Jesus is demonstrating for the disciples that when faced with all that the natural world can throw against them, uh, when everything that they've counted on to save them is insufficient, is gone, and and, and gone, I believe what Jesus is driving at here is is he stands in both parts of the story, is he's asking you and me the question, as he's asking them the question at the same time, in whom is your faith? You see, it's not that they lost their faith and they hid it behind something, but it's, the question is more directed towards who is your faith placed in? And we know that our faith is not in the things that we bring, but it's in the person of Jesus Christ. The great Dutch painter Rembrandt, he created a painting detailing the first part of the story, and it's titled Christ in the Storm on the Sea of Galilee. You used to be able to go see it at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, but I think many of you know uh, there was a robbery there, and, uh, and that was taken, and so you can't see it anymore. But we, we can look it up online and see a picture of it, see what that painting looked like. Now, if you look at this painting, you'll see in it the boat is raised up on an angle on the waves, and, and some of the disciples are wrestling with the sail, and others are pleading with J- Jesus to wake up, and you've got the light and the dark contrast that show the tension of life and death. If you look closely... Right in the middle of the scene, there's one character who's grasping onto a rope and he's holding onto his hat and he's staring out at you and me, the viewer, and it's as though he's asking this, what about you? Where is your faith? In whom is your faith? Now it's been established that this character right in the middle is a self-portrait of Rembrandt himself. And this is something that he typically did. He painted himself into the different things that he did. But it's not just his face. If you took a magnifying glass and if you put it on the rudder of the ship, you would see that his name is also Rembrandt etched into the rudder of the ship, showing you that this boat is a representation of his life, just like it's a representation of all of our lives. You see, what I believe Rembrandt is doing here is he's asking the question to you and to me. When the storms of life hit, when you're afraid, what do you do? When the winds start to rise up in your relationships and you don't know how you're going to make it through, where do you go? When the circumstances swell up and they crash down upon you, when financial worries pelt you like the rain, when anxiety and depression turn to panic and they rock your life like a boat in the storm, when the lies of the enemy rip through your confidence like wind through a sail, when the demonic accusations and the doubts look like a wall of water before you, when all the natural and all the supernatural presses in, the question, brothers and sisters, for you today is so clear and so necessary. In whom is your faith? In whom is your faith? You see, we can try to rescue ourselves. We can try to take all the right and good steps to try to fight back against all that ails us in the natural and in the supernatural, but at the center of it all. In every battle that you face, you and I are not strong enough on our own. At the center of every response must be Jesus. It has to be faith in Jesus. Every day we need to run to the only one who the psalmist declared is our tower of refuge and strength. When we find ourselves in difficult circumstances and in difficult trials or when we find ourselves with spiritual oppression or attack that presses in upon us, do you know that it's natural for us to be afraid? That's okay. It happens to all of us. It's a regular part of the human experience. And yet, in our fear, brothers and sisters, Jesus calls you and me to himself. He calls you and me to trust that he is greater and stronger than everything that you're facing. And in some cases, Jesus will quiet the wind and the waves in your lives and he'll do it immediately. And you will see his strength on display magnificently and miraculously. But church, sometimes he won't do that. 
Sometimes he won't do it immediately. He promises that one day, because of the victory that we have in Jesus, one day he will calm every storm. He will wipe away every tear and every sorrow will vanish. But sometimes Jesus is going to hold off in this world, in this life, and he's going to let you bear through a struggle so that he can show you his strength in another way. Sometimes Jesus' strength will be so evident to you in the way that he shelters you in the way that he embraces you through those dark moments. You see, in a world that teaches you and me that from the beginning we're independent and that we're in control, clearly we see and we know that we need someone greater, that we are not. You see, the storm, the storms in our life, they they strip us of control and they show us our desperate need for a Savior. It's when we turn to Jesus, church, in those moments that we discover the intimacy, the security, we discover the hope that we never could have experienced otherwise. There's a famous British pastor who battled with depression his whole ministry, and this is what he said. I've learned to kiss the waves that throw me up against the rock of ages. You see, sometimes Jesus tells the storm, peace, be still. And other times, Jesus gives us the opportunity to experience in a rich and deep way that ultimately, He is our peace. When the storms of life hit, whether natural or supernatural, may we not be a people who shake our fists up at God and say, Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? Instead, may we run to Jesus and exchange our fear for faith in Him who is greater. You see, faith in Jesus trusts in his presence that no matter what happens, Jesus will never leave you or forsake you. Faith in Jesus trusts in his promises that he will carry us through to the promised land and he will restore us fully someday. Faith in Jesus trusts in his character that he is good and that he works all things out for our good. If we can just get to a place of exchanging our fear for faith, In Jesus, we would find that Jesus truly is God, the true Messiah, who is greater than everything. And it's in those moments, church, those moments when you start to flourish in this life. I'm going to close with this story. You know, when I was uh, growing up, I grew up as a missionary kid. And so I grew up in West Africa. And uh, every once in a while, the denomination that we were part of would bring us home and bring us back to the United States, and they'd take us to this annual conference that we could go to, and my parents could be encouraged by all these different speakers, but for the kids, they would take us to an amusement park. And so I remember one time I went to Florida, I went to this big amusement park, and and I got to meet all these new friends. I was really excited for all the new friends I got to meet, and for all that I got to see in the United States, I got to to eat McDonald's, you know, all these amazing things, which not really amazing, right? But it was amazing to me at the time. And so we went to this amusement park, and I remember all my new friends were very excited about all the roller coasters that were there. But coming from Africa, I had never really been on a roller coaster, and so I was terrified at the idea of these things that I saw that they wanted to ride on. And so we got in line for these roller coasters, and everyone's talking about how exciting it is. And again, I'm scared. And do you know what happens when you're standing in line for a roller coaster? It's like a horror show on repeat over and over and over again. You just hear the screams. You see the people, the feet dangling. It's just on on repeat. And so I'm getting more and more nervous as we're standing in line. But I want to impress my new friends. I want my new friends to think I'm cool. And so I just keep going through it, going through it. And by God's providence, you know who would be in the front of the line, who gets to sit in the very front of the roller coaster when it gets there? It's this guy. So God had reserved that seat for me. And so I sat in the very front of the roller coaster, and I got strapped in, and my friend's right there next to me. And he's like, man, aren't you excited? This is going to be great. And I'm like, yeah, this is going to be so good. It's so cool. And then, you know, we start to go up. And you know what? Click, 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 as it's bringing up slowly. And I look over, and my friend's not watching. So what do I do? I close my eyes. I close my eyes, and I just, I'm going to bear through it. And then we're off, and we're going around and screaming, and I can feel myself going upside down and my feet dangling. And then as as the roller coaster starts to get to the end of the ride, again, I've never been on one of these. I don't know what the end of the ride is. I still got my eyes closed. As we start to get to the end of the ride, my my friend says, hey, John, wasn't that amazing? And I'm like, oh, it's the best. It's the best. And he goes, John, are your eyes closed? And I was like, oh, no, man, it's just a bug, just a bug. 
tried to play it off cool. I was terrified. And because I didn't trust the machine, I didn't try it. As I got older, I started to trust the machine more. I started to be able to enjoy roller coasters more. Do you know that in this world that might seem scary at times, you can trust your Savior. You can trust Jesus. And it's only when you exchange your fear for faith in Him that you truly start to flourish this side of heaven. Amen? It's only in those places when you put complete trust in Christ that you find the pathway to joy. What are the storms and the attacks that you're facing today? Exchange your fear in those moments for faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is God, the true Messiah, who is greater than everything. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you today for who you are. We thank you, God, that you love us, you care for us, that you hold us, you carry us through, that you are, in fact, superior to whatever stands in our way. We thank you that because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, we have that promise that we too will be completely victorious one day and stand victorious even now. So today, Lord, as we take a moment to respond, I just pray that if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that doesn't have that security, Lord, that today would be the day that those burdens would be laid down, that all the fears of this world would be handed over as there's trust in you and in your sacrifice, there's faith in what you offer. And so God, right now I ask in Jesus' name that you would help us to take t- steps of faith towards you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This media has been made available by Arborway Community Church in Boston, Massachusetts. At Arborway, we invite people to walk with Jesus together. If you would like to check out more resources, learn about Arborway Community Church, or donate to this ministry, please visit arborwaychurch.com.